in our last session, our last class, I talked about market failure in New Jersey and Massachusetts. I remember when New Jersey's happened, there was a Republican governor, very popular, uh, I forget her name, Christy Christie, something like that. Very popular. Uh, everything was going great in New Jersey, but she almost lost the re-election entirely because of this auto insurance uh, fiasco that was going on. Uh, other than that, she was very, very, very popular. Um, <clears throat> but both New Jersey and Massachusetts have strict prior approval rate regulation. It's made auto insurance unprofitable, somewhat like what we saw in Texas with mold is making homeowners insurance unprofitable in the state. Both states have rate tampering to reduce the cost burden on urban residents. Um, urban residents should be spending, paying higher because they're riskier, but the state says, no, we're not going to let you do that. So the voluntary market for auto insurance ceased to exist. More than half the drivers were in the residual market. Remember, the residual market are those people who can go to the state and say, I try to get insurance at an affordable rate and I couldn't do it. So now I'm coming to the state, and then the state would then assign those drivers to the insurance industry at huge losses. And I remember, at U, I remember at USA just how large those losses were. It was quite an unprofitable business. <clears throat> so why don't insurance just insurers just get completely out of these states? Well, it's one thing, and I don't know why this hasn't been challenged in the Supreme Court, or if it has, what the, out, what the outcome was. But some states say, hey, if you stop selling auto insurance, you also lose your license for all other insurance. That seems unconstitutional to me. It just seems, you know, if I have a restaurant with a side business doing barbershops and barbershops are losing money, I think I should have the right to shut down my barbershop without the state telling me I also have to shut down my restaurant. But that's, that's the game they were playing. We license you. We license you for auto and homeowners insurance. So you think about a firm, this is more in Florida with homeowners insurance because companies are trying to flee Florida for homeowners. You know, they tell you, hey, if you flee on homeowners, you also have to leave for auto. The exact opposite is New Jersey and Massachusetts. But you think about a firm like Progressive or Geico who only do auto, the huge advantage that they have because they don't do homeowners at all and the state's not shutting them down. So it's an interesting debate, and I wish a company would challenge this in the Supreme Court, or I wish I could find out why it hasn't been done. Uh, but they may get other coverages, workers' comp, uh, commercial auto, homeowners, all those kind of things. And so the state might just say, hey, we'll cancel your license if you, if you stop writing auto insurance. Uh, <clears throat> but even though they can't get completely out of an unprofitable business market, they can definitely take steps to try to reduce their costs. They can provide really bad service. That was one of my recommendations to USA. We talked in class that 4% of USA's customers account for 90 something percent of their probable maximum loss. So if USA got rid of those 4% of the business customers, they could probably send every USA member a four or $5,000 check for nothing to just for getting rid of those customers. So my recommendation was, hey, just give them really horrible service. Maybe they'll go away on their own. Uh, but just, just not part of USA's philosophy. Uh, I think it's something they should keep debating because they're really harming the overall membership by keeping that small percent that live in very dangerous areas with subsidized, whose homeowner's insurance is being subsidized by all the other customers. Um, so these regulatory responses can destabilize a, a market so yeah, auto insurance might be cheaper in New Jersey, Massachusetts, but you may have a tough time finding any because the markets are shutting down. <clears throat> um, is the auto insurance industry competitive or non-competitive? Uh, there are several insurance companies, but many of these are really small companies. Some of them only are only brokerage services that they don't even count. A lot of these 1,300, as we saw, remember when we looked at all states schedule Y and all those insurance companies they had, you know, they had one for Texas, one for New York, they had multiple in Texas. Uh, you count, you take all of those out, there really aren't that many uh, insurance companies. Uh, and then certain companies really specialize either by geography, by line of business. 
Um, when you look at it, especially on auto insurance, you could probably list the main players, Progressive, Farmers, Allstate, State Farm, USAA, Geico, um, Allstate, you know, I probably mentioned some of them twice, um, Hartford, and there's a few others that do commercial as well as the personal lines. Um, I think it's a fairly competitive market just with that, that group. Um, but it depends on what kind of driver you are and where you, you live. So rated drivers, those with bad, with bad driving histories, they're going to have a big problem. Good drivers with a good driving history, good credit scores, will probably not have any trouble finding good competitive rates. <clears throat> um, another problem is how concentrated the market is. So it's possible San Antonio is very competitive. But you go to a state like Hawaii, where there's just a few insurance companies, can be very uncompetitive. Um, the concentration ratio, if you, we talked about the Herfindahl Index, and I recommend you look it up, especially if you're an actuary. It's, it's the auto insurance side, the Herfindahl Index. It's very important and very easy to calculate. Um, for State Farm, at the time this article was written, they were 21% of the market. I doubt they're that much of the market today because Progressive and Geico have grown so fast. Uh, the top four companies were pretty concentrated. Um, in some states, it's even more concentrated. So um, they can range from 33% in New Hampshire to 81%. As I mentioned, you know, in states like Alaska and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So the more concentrated, the more probability or chance there is uh, these companies are charging higher rates because there's not much competition there. But if they're really overcharging, you know, it's not that difficult for an insurance company to come, to come into a state. So you would think Allstate or Geico or Progressive would come into these states if there's not competitive pricing. Some of these markets are so small, they may not be entirely worth the effort, but they're certainly... You know, if, if the profits are there, companies will at least look at it. Um, the other one reason why economists don't generally look at, think of this as an uncompetitive industry is because the concentration, the growth in market share, is a lot like Amazon. It's happening because not because of market power, but because that's what the customers want. Won't so you have companies like Geico, Progressive that are doing more direct writing. So what direct writing means is they sell auto insurance without a commission. State Farm sells with a commission. Uh, all state nationwide, they have exclusive agents. That makes their cost structure much, much, much higher. And because of that, direct riders like Geico, Progressive, USAA, USA is a direct rider, their cost structure is so much lower that they have lower rates. So the reason these companies are growing so fast is because they have a huge competitive advantage. That's one of the reasons USA restructured. When I was at USA before the restructuring, our expense ratio was 30%. That was in line with State Farm, but USA was a direct rider and State Farm paid commissions. Geico and Progressive were in the 18 to 20% range. So USA was a good 50% more expensive, had 50% more expenses, expenses, higher expenses than they should have. And that's the reason why USA cut a fourth of its uh, employee base they were just really too expensive too expense heavy so you're seeing independent agents start slowly going away even Allstate even though they use independent agents Allstate has moved more and more to online you probably have heard of eSurance which is an Allstate product State Farm's the one that seems at least the last time I heard from them heard from them the least likely to move to direct writing because their agents are so important to their business and if they did direct writing, their agents would complain. And, and that's a, it's a fairly strong um, sales force. They're quite dedicated to the State Farm. You, you see the little boxes they have around the city. Um, and they can sell other things besides auto and homeowners insurance. They have some lucrative life insurance products they can sell. So I think State Farm, as far as I, I know, last I've heard, they're sticking with the independent agent uh, model. <clears throat> So economists don't generally worry about increasing concentration if it's because of an expense advantage. Firms are just cheaper. Consumers are going there because the product's actually better. That's why I think economists aren't as worried about Amazon yet because you have Amazon and Walmart both 
trying to kill each other on being the cheapest out there in Costco and others. So they're still, even they're big, big players, they're competing on the right thing, which is getting a better product at a cheaper price. Now, another thing you can look at as far as is the industry to concentrate is profitability. And I'll spare you reading through all of this. The bottom line of this section is profitability is very hard to measure. You can do it on a statutory basis. You can do it on a gap basis. But at the time this article was written, the insurance industry was not very profitable. In any kind of measure you would do a profitability, it was not profitable. And part of the problem here was uh, the way the regulators looked at this, they would say, well, the last 10 years, your return on equity was 6%, so you should be fine with 6% going forward. Essentially, the regulators were saying, hey, that's what you made in the past. That should have been good enough. It should be good enough going forward, not realizing that the insurance industry is going through a major transition and profitability was falling dramatically. They weren't making their required returns. They are making much less than the required returns. Uh, since that time, since the time this article has been written, auto insurance has become much more profitable and uh, it's homeowners that's been the issue because of things like Hurricane Harvey and Katrina. Um, you've seen these big loss losses on the homeowner side because of hurricanes and fires in California. But the auto insurance business has actually been fairly profitable, even with Geico and Progressive making it more competitive. I think Geico and Pre Progressive have had a great impact. You know, it definitely helped USA get its act together, but I think it's helped the entire industry become better. At, at managing expenses. So they have become more profitable. They're not as profitable in the heavily regulated states like California and New, New Jersey, Massachusetts and Hawaii and Georgia. Uh, and so essentially the other 40 or so states are subsidizing the drivers in that state. But overall the industry is making money and they're fine with it. They would probably do a whole lot better if they just left those states. But, um, but how you measure that? Do you measure it on a book value basis? If it's on a book value basis, do you use statutory? Do you use GAAP? If it's on a market value basis, this industry, at the time this article was written, this industry was an underperforming sector versus the rest of the S&P 500. Those are old numbers. I was going to give you updated numbers, but because I can't get on campus, I cannot give you updated numbers. So, and I just, the numbers I have are so old, I just don't want to show them to you. They're not as old as here, obviously. Um, so you have debate about book return versus market return. I don't think that's as critical other than saying it's complicated. Probably the best measure for any industry is how the industry has performed relative to the overall stock market, relative to its beta. You have to adjust for beta too. You would expect certain industries to have lower returns just because they're lower risk and lower debt. But when you adjust for all of that, this industry was very unprofitable in the 70s and 80s, has become much more profitable in the 90s with the exception of some of the high risk with homeowners insurance. So I'll spare you all of that. A lot of numbers that are so out of date, it's just not worth looking at. All right, so the bottom line of this article, and they do a really strange kind of flip here at the end uh, because they bring up something that they hadn't talked about anywhere else. But if regulation is not the answer, what should you do? Um, how do you cut inflation for claims costs? How can you get companies more efficient looking at this more? and they come down to tort reform. So they haven't talked about tort reform. Tort reform, in my opinion, was not that huge of an issue with auto insurance. The article we talked about with tort reform, it showed that auto insurance used to be a bigger issue than it is today, so maybe at the time of this article it was a bigger issue. Certainly, tort reform was a big issue during President W. Bush, w. Bush's term. Um, there has been reform on the legal side to reduce the incentive for people to sue. Some states like California, most auto insurance claims were involving trial lawyers. You don't see that in most states, and I think even California saw the problem with that and reformed some of the rules. So that's their bottom line is tort reform, but uh, I, think, I think what the bottom line is is what they mentioned, the direct riders. I really think that's the key. Progressive Geico, it's USA getting their act together, all state with insurance. It's companies discovering that this was a very inefficient industry and players stepping in and, and just doing it much better. But this is still an issue. Is this industry competitive? If it is competitive, is it profitable? Those are numbers. You, If you work in this industry, you would definitely want to try to get that information. And if you can get back on campus, Bloomberg does have information that can help you assess that kind of, that kind of of those kind of questions. And 
and it would be good if you're interviewing for the insurance company. I would encourage you, the problem with Bloomberg is it only has publicly traded companies. It does have statutory information, so with a GEICO, you can get information on, on GEICO. The problem is breaking it out between lines of business, between auto and home. The best would be have access to that SNL database, but we don't have access to that. So it's a little tough to get the data, um, but you can get all the publicly traded companies. You can look at their returns. You can get some stat numbers so you can look at combined ratios and get a sense of how profitable they are. Um, but it, it is definitely a challenge for this industry. Um, the other issue you have with this industry is, as I've been alluding to, is a state-by-state -state analysis. Some states are very profitable in auto, but unprofitable in homeowners. So Texas is a good example where the homeowners has been a mess, as you've seen, with hurricanes and mold and tornadoes, whereas auto has been very profitable. Some states like California, everything's unprofitable. California, the auto insurance is very unprofitable and really terrible regulation where th this companies have to charge the, uh, rural drivers the same that they charge uh, city drivers. Homeowners is a mess because of the earthquake risk and the fires and the mudslides. So um, some states like New Hampshire or Montana, there's no problems anywhere. They're just very safe states. So it's all over the place. So for you actuaries, if you're an actuary and you start on this in this business, either in the homeowner side or the auto side, if you start on the personal line side, probably even on the commercial side too, you're going to find very quickly that this is very, very state dependent. And which state you get assigned is going to be a radically different process and understanding than if you got assigned to a different state. Um, so that's part of the challenge. That's why I say if you're an actuary and you're having trouble finding an actuarial job, that's why jobs like claims, underwriting, policy service can be great jobs for an entry level for an actuary while you're working on getting the exams. You know, they won't even talk to you until you get a couple exams behind you. But while you're waiting to get those exams, work in those areas. It's amazing. Claims is a terrible area to, area to work. It probably won't be that much fun. But if you go into it thinking, I'm going to get educated in this industry, boy, working in claims is a wonderful way to learn this business before you become a pricing actuary or reserving actuary. Underwriting probably even better. And underwriting is probably a more pleasant job. It may be a little diff more difficult to get into, but it's a great job. I have some people that are actuaries and are not sure they want to do all the exams. So you start in claims and you move to underwriting. I have one former student had a career doing that and she eventually moved into data science and boy she loved it has been doing extremely well in that area really didn't she works with actuaries all the time but never pursued the actuarial side so you can definitely you know I wanted this article to just whet the appetite on on what the issues are what the challenges are there are definitely some frustrations with actuarial science but you can also see that it's such a mess there's also great opportunities in this field. So that's it for regulation as far as rate regulation. The next session we'll talk about um, a little bit of the history of regulation, regulation, some really important things such as the, um, uh, the state regulation and what's happening with um, McCarran-Ferguson and those type of things.